Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. <clears throat> Take your Bible, if you will, and look with me to the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter, and you're going to be hearing that phrase for the next 10 weeks. Exodus chapter uh, number 20, and uh, we're beginning a brand new series today uh, on the Ten Commandments as they relate to the family, and we've entitled uh, this little series, Flip My Home, Flip My Home. In other words, uh, help me out in my home life. You know, we're talking uh, about family values and I mean, when you look back on the last two presidential elections uh, in America, family values was thrown out so loosely. Uh, all kinds of slogans that related, you know, bringing America back uh, to the traditional family values and uh, to strong family values, on and on and on. We heard that uh, in the last uh, eight years. Uh, it's been pretty phenomenal, as a matter of fact. And uh, I've got news. Republicans didn't invent family values. Democrats didn't invent family values. You want an interesting thing to do? Just go Google family values and look at the various approaches that are out there uh, in regards to that. I came up uh, in the 1960s as many of you have. And back in the 1960s, it was just, you know, live any way you want to live. Uh, just whatever you feel like doing, go ahead and do it. No parameters, no barriers, just living life, however. And uh, nowadays, we are seeing the results of that. We're seeing the consequences of that philosophy, if you will, uh, there is a divorce in this country every 13 seconds. Gets worse. Four out of every 10 babies born in America today are born to an unwed mother. Pretty strong. And it all is born out of those values that were either thrown away or new ones that were embraced. God gave... Uh, Ten commandments. He didn't give ten suggestions or ten options. He gave us ten commandments that became the bedrock for Western civilization and also as the basis for our judicial system in this country. These ten commandments are agreed upon by Jews, Muslims, and Christians alike who all say that they came from Jehovah God. And they agree that they came from God. God says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, he says, Take these Ten Commandments and teach them diligently to your children. Write them down where they can see them every moment of their life. Brand it in their hearts, if you will. Let me ask you parents uh, a question this morning. Do your children believe in the Ten Commandments? Do they live by the Ten Commandments? If I were to ask your kids, what are the Ten Commandments? Could they recite them? And so I come back with the question, how can you live by them if you don't know them? And God gave these for us as a standard by which to live uh, our lives. He didn't give them to hurt us, he gave them to help us. He didn't give them to restrict us, he came to release us. He didn't give them to us to punish us, he gave them to protect us. How many of you taught your kids, don't play with fire? Don't play with fire. Now, why did you tell them uh, not to play with fire? Did you tell them that to, for your good or for theirs? And it's exactly the same principle that God gave us the Ten Commandments. He didn't give them for him. He gave them for us to bless us, just as if these other universal laws that God created when he created everything that we know, he, one of those is the law of gravity. He put that law of gravity in place. 
And he says, um, you get up here on the top of the steeple and you jump off the top of this steeple, it ain't going to end up good. And, and, and the same principle with the commandments. If you break these commandments, it's going to mess you up. It's not going to turn out like you think it ought to turn out. Several years ago, I uh, developed a, a, a wedding ceremony based on the Ten Commandments for my daughter's wedding. She's been married now 26 years. Now, I don't know how many times that I've used those Ten Commandments for weddings in the last 26 years, but it's been a lot. My wife, she's, uh, <laughs> she goes to these weddings with me from time to time. She says, you gonna do that long one today? But I want to take the Ten Commandments in this wedding ceremony that we've been doing for a number of years and I want to expand it. I want to take it not just for a one-shot deal in a, in a wedding occasion, but I want, to, I want to just really expand it into ten different messages today. And the first one we're going to dig into um, is the one I believe God gave as the priority. Uh, I believe this first one was uh, given as the basis for the other nine that are to come. And God says, you got to get this one right first. And if you don't get this one right first, uh, all of the other nine following it won't mean anything. Now, Kathy and I have uh, built three houses uh, in the last many, many years. Um, you remember we subbed out a house ourselves right over here on Oak Spring. And then we built uh, Kathy's mom a little house over here off of Chestnut and and then we built the house that we're in now and been in for about 25 years. And um, one of the things that we've learned is that if you don't get started right, uh, the rest of it's going to get messed up. And I'd always get really frustrated on how slow it was in the very beginning and, and getting that footing dug and getting the foundation poured. And, and I had guys that were advising me, and I preacher, just slow down and be a little bit patient here because if you don't get this right, it won't be any use doing that other because it'll fall down. So the foundation has got to be right. And if we don't get today right, then the rest of it is going to crumble. Let's pick it up now in Exodus 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Powerful text. The principle here is this, is that God has to be number one in your life. Uh, I start out that ceremony with this very first commandment and I say to them, now today you are saying that there's not going to be anyone else any more important to you than the person that you are marrying. And God is saying, there can't be any other ahead of me. I've got to be out front in your life. I've got to have the priority of your life. Uh, I've got to have first place uh, in your life. And he says, I want to be number one. I demand the priority of your life. Now, why in the world wouldn't he demand the priority of our life? He made us after all. He formed us. He gave us life. Matter of fact, listen to this. You can't name anything that you have that God didn't give you. It all comes from him. And so it's just natural, says God, now, since I gave you life and since I sent my son to give you eternal life and I've given you everything in between, I ought to be number one in your life, and I demand it. And so he gives us that commandment. He says, you'll have no other gods before me. Notice that that is a little g. It's not a big g, it's the little g. And he's saying these little things in life, everything that you can name, you can't put that in front of me. You can't have another person in front of me. You can't have another thing in front of me. I have to be out front leading the priority of your life. Anything that takes precedence over him is one of these little gods. Now we're watching families drop like flies. Matter of fact, um, I, I can name you about three families right now just in recent days, been married over 50 years, wound up in a divorce court. 
One of the marriages was 57 years and wound up in a divorce court. Uh, families are dropping uh, like flies, and the reason is oftentimes they're built on a faulty foundation. God has to be first. Now, that's the principle, and every time that God gives a principle in the Word of God, He also gives a promise uh, in the Word of God. Now, notice Proverbs chapter 3. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him or submit to him and he will direct your path. He will bring about a successful ending to this if you put him first. So do you want God to bless your life? Do you want to be successful in your marriage and in your family? Uh, then you got to have God out front. Now, by the way, let me, before I go any further in this, Think with me for just a minute. You can't, you can't get God out front in somebody else's life. You can't make God the priority in your spouse's life. You can't change your partner. And the only thing that you can do is let God be the priority in your life. So quit looking at the spiritual needs of somebody else in your family, and let's just reflect for a few minutes uh, on where God is in your life and where he needs to be. I saw an article just recently uh, written by a guy named David Stroop. And uh, David did all kinds of research into families. And uh, one of the things that he found out was this. Yeah, there's a divorce uh, happening about every 13 seconds in this country. But he said the couple that prays together on a regular basis, attends church and prays together on a regular basis, that number goes to one out of 1,000. Mm. You think going to church makes a difference? You think that prayer makes a difference in their life? Having a regular spot in their home and their life when as a family they are seeking God? The problem is, only about 4% of the couples pray together. Only about 4% of those that claim to be Christians have a time in their home where they pray together. Now, so the principle is put God first. The promise is this, I will direct your path. I will bring about success. So think with me for a minute about how to really divorce-proof your marriage. And, and I want to... <laughs> I'm going to do something I've only done one other time in 38 years as your pastor. I'm going to go back and, and I'm going to pull some things out that I recently did. And uh, I'm doing it uh, because we've got a greater number of people that are attending and will hear this message today. And another thing is, I don't think I could repeat it enough. I don't think I could reiterate it enough. Uh, so I want to go back into uh, one of the messages that I did on the Lord's Prayer and I want to take some of the things that I pulled out of that and, and I want to expand on it some. So here we go. I want to talk to you. There are five things that I believe that you need to do to get God out front. I want to take the acrostic up front and pull from that. You ready for this one? Number one, God ought to be out front in your finances. He ought to be out front in your finances. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. And here's the promise. So your barns will be filled with plenty. He says, uh, give first and then I will bless the rest. Now here's something that I know. Uh, I was going to use the term checkbooks, but nobody writes checks anymore. So here's what I do know. If we could take your monthly bank statement and we were to give your monthly bank statement to a total stranger sitting in this building today, they could look at your bank statement and they could tell from that what the priorities of your life are. They could look at your bank statement and tell whether or not God is first in your life, whether he is the priority or there's some other priority. There's some other passion uh, that is out there. 
Deuteronomy chapter 14 says that the purpose of the tithe is to teach us to put God out front in our lives. Now, COVID has hit for the last 12, 14 months. And uh, I know that it has uh, had some adverse effects on a lot of families. Many lost their jobs and many have been suffering greatly financially through uh, this particular era in our time. Uh, I, I want to try to help you, if I can, uh, with that. The step one in getting out from under the stress of that financial burden is to put God out front in your finances. In, in other words, uh, li listen to this. Whatever you want God to bless, then put him first in it. If you want him to bless you financially, put God first in your financial life. That is so, so, so very important. You understand, if he's not first in your life in that area, he's not first in your life. When he ought to do that? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16 that on the first day of the week we ought to lay by in store, that we ought to give him that 10% up front in our life. You remember the passage we just read a few minutes ago, so that your barns would be filled and be in plenty. Now, the first day of the week, what day is that? That's Sunday. Now, my, my wife and I try to model generosity. We, we really do. Uh, we, we've learned this principle a long time uh, ago. And uh, we, we help a lot of nonprofit organizations. We help um, in, in a lot of charitable places and, and, and give to help support several things. But one thing that we know is that what God is teaching here in the Scripture in 1 Corinthians 16 is that on the first day of the week, that 10% goes to the storehouse. We don't take what God says to bring to the storehouse and use that to bless others. I believe you ought to, you ought to help other charities. You ought to help uh, other people that are maybe doing the work of God. But the tithe belongs in the storehouse. It belongs on that first day of the week. Why is that? Because, it, listen, listen, it's an act of worship. And you give it as an act of worship when uh, that you worship. Now, so we've got finances. The R stands for relationships. God ought to be out front in our relationships. Um, you understand if God is first in your life, you're really going to spend time choosing. Now, you students and young people listen closely. If God's out front, choose your friends Wisely, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 19. The Bible says that a person's heart is reflected by the choices uh, that they make in their life. Why is that so important? Because the fact of the matter is you're going to become who you hang around. You're going to become who you spend time with. If you're around people that take God lightly, they got, they're, they're gospel light. It won't be long until you become a casual believer yourself. But if you're around people that are truly, genuinely committed, that take the word of God seriously, you're going to become a much more strong believer. Now, now, let me just talk to the moms and dads here for a minute. Who do you allow in your house? Who do the children growing up in your home see that you have brought before them as a model that you want them in their behavior. I, th I think it's extremely important, parents, that you bring godly people into your life. You bring godly people into the lives of your children that you model it yourself because if you don't bring godly models into their life, guess what? Television's going to be their model. Computers are going to be their model. Video games are going to be their model. Their peers will become their model. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26, the righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Let me... <laughs> Hey, students and young people, and, and, and particularly, there are some relationships that you have in your life. Matter of fact, some of you parents, 
And some of you adults that are here, there are some relationships that you have in your life right now that are dead wrong for you. I, I've watched this down through the years so often. Some of our young people have, that are so on fire for the Lord, so filled with the Holy Spirit, so in tune with Jesus, and, and they get wooed by some other person that has a little bit of charisma about them and instead of holding on to the principles that they have been brought and been taught, they get wooed into a relationship that they ought not to be in. And before long, they're sleeping around and doing some things that they ought not to be doing and involved in a relationship that may ultimately wind up at the wedding vows and all of a sudden married to somebody that does not have the biblical values that they possess. I've watched it time and time again. It's easier to pull somebody down than it is to pull somebody up. Hey, hey, let me give you the O. I won't spend a whole lot of time here, but we've looked at finances. We've looked at relationships. Now let's look at the O for a minute. It's other interests. Other interests like your hobbies, like your vacation, like your recreation, like your pastimes that are there. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, the Bible says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now, I love to play golf. Now, I'll be honest with you. I get frustrated on the golf course sometimes when I don't play as good as I think that I ought to play. And I, I, I'll begin to check my attitude a little bit, my disposition, and maybe uh, some of the, the, the things that I might say. I, I have to wait just a minute now. Uh, God's not happy with my attitude. And I ought to, instead of getting aggravated at a bad shot, I ought to be like, wow, praise God. Uh, I'm not having to conduct a funeral today. I'm out on a golf course. Uh, I, I'm not having to go to the hospital today. I'm on a, you know, God's given me some wonderful weather. Everything that we do, whether it's golf or whether it's fishing, whether it's our vacation, whether it's knitting, whatever we do, the Bible says do it all for the glory of God. Of God. Have an attitude of gratitude uh, about it. You understand that passion actually reveals our priorities. Say that with me. Passions reveal priorities. Say it. Passions reveal priorities. Now, I, I'm a Carolina Panther fan. You can whatever you want to say about it. I, I, I pull for the Carolina Panthers. I go to a game every once in a while. I've got a couple of t-shirts and I'll wear them around and I keep up with their trades and their acquisitions and, and, and I'll keep up with all of that. And, and as a result of me talking about them, uh, people often say, well, he's a fan. But now you let me talk about Jesus as much as I talk about the Carolina Panthers. Or maybe more. And I'm not a Jesus fan. I'm a Jesus fanatic. In a lot of people's minds. So, so you know, your passions are oftentimes revealed by what you talk about. It, isn't it amazing that people can spend hours talking about another person? They can spend hours talking about their habits. They can spend hours talking about them as people, but they can't spend three minutes talking about Jesus. Your passion reveals your priorities. And if he's out front, if God is first, if he's the priority, you're not going to be ashamed to talk about him. You're not going to be afraid what people are going to say when you talk about Christ if he's really out front. So your other interests reveal if God is first or not. Let me give you this, the next one. F-R-O-N is nuisances. Now you've heard me talk about this before and uh, it, it, it happens all of the time when sudden things take place in our life, when the unexpected occurs. Uh, when we run into an obstacle that is out there or a problem that we didn't see coming and all of a sudden we're having to deal with issues that were not on our calendar, that were not on our plans, that were uh, not on our agenda and, and it becomes a problem to us. Um, and God says, uh, you don't need to be handling that. I, I can handle that for you. Cast all your cares on me 
because I care for you. And I've had people say this to me uh, down through the years. Well, Pastor, um, you know, I, I don't really bother God with the good things that are going on in my life. So when something bad happens, uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to bother him with the bad. God says, put it on me. Let me deal with it. I can handle it. Trouble me with it. Burden me with it. I want it. I can do better with it than you can. I've never understood why that God is always a last resort rather than a first response. We want to handle it. We want to deal with it. Uh, we want to figure it out. Let, let, me, let me share something with you for just a minute. Um, Psalm 50 says, call on me in your day of trouble. And I will deliver you. Isn't that a good word? Can I get a witness from anybody? Call on me in your day of trouble and I'll help you. You, you know what happens when God is not out front with your finances? You worry about them. You know what happens when God is not out front and first in your life and relationships? You worry about them. You stress over them. You know what happens when God is not out front in all of your interest in your life? You worry about it. You stress over it. You get anxious about it. God says, put me first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these other things will be added to you. I believe with all of my heart, friends, putting God out front, having him first in your life, with God being the priority of your life, it is a vaccine against worry. Let me give you the last one if I could. Uh, and it's time, finances, relationship, other interest, nuisances, and time. Ephesians chapter 5 says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, how does God get to be out front in my daily life? How does he get out front on my schedule? I wonder how many of you, those of you that are watching by live stream or television, I wonder how many of you wake up in the morning and you have 99 things to do that day. And all of a sudden you think, what am I going to do? Which direction should I go? How am I going to handle it? I just got so much to do. And you start fretting and you get frazzled. You get discombobulated. Have you ever really sat down and analyzed that most of that stuff God didn't Put on your schedule. Maybe you just need to stop in the morning and say, okay, God, now wait a minute. <laughs> There's no way that I have time to do all of this stuff. And God says, I know you don't have time to do all that stuff. Here's something else you need to know right now, okay? Uh, God is not going to require of you that which you don't have time to do. God will never put more on you than what you have time to accomplish. And so if you've got a hundred things to do, maybe about 90 of that stuff God didn't initiate. And maybe we ought to be spending time figuring out what God did initiate. What did he do? What did he put uh, on our table? And so you begin seeking the Lord. Okay, God, I want to do what you want me to do today, which means somewhere along the way, you have to have a daily appointment with God. How many of you, don't, don't answer, but don't raise your hand. But I wonder how many of you have a daily appointment with God? Everybody in the room, if, if God's going to be first, if he's going to be out front, if he's going to be the priority of your life, then you've got to spend time with him. Now, some of you are extreme morning people. You get up early. Well, maybe you just need to get up 15 minutes earlier in order to spend time with God. Maybe some of you 
It would be in the middle of the day on your lunch hour and you're at work and you've finally gotten awake and you, you, you kind of got some, your, your, your legs under you and, and, and the middle of the day works better for you rather than uh, going out to eat lunch every day or, or hanging out with a bunch of people. Maybe you just need to back off and say, you know what, I'm going to devote 15, 20 minutes of my lunch hour today every day just to give to God. And maybe for some of you, you, you do better at the end of the day and it's after you've got the kids, they're, they're in bed and, and things have quietened down. And it may be then that you could just take the word and, and find an isolated spot for you and God. It doesn't really matter when, but you ought to have an appointment at some time of the day with God. You know, if Jesus had the need and had the desire to be along with his father, who in the world are we to think that we can go through our life without a time with him too? We have to have a time with God, a daily time set aside. Um, Jeremiah asked him an amazing question, or maybe he made a statement. He said, my people, God said it in, through Jeremiah, my people have forgotten me for days on end. I wonder how long it's been since some of you had time with God. And maybe today is the day that you decide, you know, I'm going to do that. If God's going to be first and I've got nine more, I've got nine more commandments to go and this is the bottom line and this is the foundation, somewhere along the way I've got to find some time in my life on a daily basis that I set aside just for me and God. Maybe you need to decide that right now. Have time to pray. Do you, I, I believe it's kind of worthwhile, don't you, to pray with your family. If, if, if that's a safeguard for me and my family that I can go from one out of, uh, fr from, from one every 16 seconds to one out of a thousand, I, I believe I might need to try that. To pray with your family. My, Kathy and I, we pray together all the time, especially over meals. We, 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 we don't ever sit down at a table without praying. We're going to reach over the table. It doesn't matter who we're with or what the setting is. Most time if we're in a restaurant, I'm going to ask the waiter or the waitress, I'm going to say, hey, is there something that I can pray for you about today? You wouldn't believe how many witnessing opportunities that gives me to share. Just ask the waiter, waiters. My, my wife and I are getting ready to pray, and uh, we, we want to pray for you. What can we pray for you about? And then we reach, we'll hold hands on the table and pray. Now, I don't pray missionary prayers over the meal. You know what I mean for that? Uh, some people wait till supper time uh, to catch up on their prayer life. There's sometimes that I say, God, I'm hungry, and I want to thank you for the food. Amen. I'll see you, you know. <laughs> But we're going to pray every time. Why is that? Because God's the priority in our life. If you're going to be who God wants you to be, he's got to be number one. He's got to be out front. He has to be the priority. If your family is going to succeed, God's got to be number one. If you're going to be who God wants you to be, you can't have anything in a higher precedence in your life than he is. How many of you could genuinely and honestly and sincerely say there's nothing or no one more important to me in my life than God? And he knows it and I know it. I spend time with him. I walk with him. I talk with him. I talk about him. I'm not ashamed of him. He is my number one. Is that true in your life? Well, if it's not, today would be a wonderful opportunity for him to become first. Would you stand with me and let's pray together? Father, I want to thank you for everybody that has taken the time this morning to come and just to celebrate Jesus. And I really suspect that there are many right now under the sound of my voice that 
really need to make some adjustments in their life. Whether it's financial or whether it's relational. Whether it's something in their occupation or their interests. Maybe it's in the midst of some difficult time that they're facing some nuisance. Maybe there's an adjustment with time that they need to make to get you out front in their life. I pray that nobody would be timid about it. Nobody would procrastinate it. But today, make that decision as a family. Start with themselves. Find a place to pray here at this altar. Just really seek you. There's some folks that are here this morning that don't know you as Lord and Savior. Oh, Father, today would be the day that they turn away from sin and receive you into their heart and into their life. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.